we keep praying for her. And it's been a really good blessing that she's uh, that she was able to come this morning. Uh, I'll pray that Miriam calms down. And my little creature lady. sisters. And Lord, we'd like to lift up some brothers and sisters in prayer this evening that you help uh, Marie uh, Barcel that she uh, that she recovers from her surgery and that she starts getting better. We, we uh, miss her and we want to see her. Um, Lord, we bring before you our sister Teresa Goff that you help her to uh, keep, uh, help her to recover and help her with her uh, family and friend relationships and um, uh, just to be there with her with her health and everything. Lord, we bring the, before you our brother Mike and that you help him with his uh, recovery of cancer. And, um, bring before you uh, Brenda Wolf that, uh, that we uh, help her to heal and grow and get back on her, uh, get back to having a more strength and Lord help all our brothers and sisters uh, to just keep leaning in on Christ and keep trusting in Him for uh, all of our all of our needs. We thank you that you provide our greatest need at the cross on Calvary. As uh, we open up your Word, help us to uh, to understand it and know it and use it to give you honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we are going over uh, Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to be going over the, the marriage.
uh, story. I'm going to read for you verses 18 through 24. Genesis 2, 18 through 24. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And what the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave the names to all livestock and birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Now, marriage has been kind of a hot topic the past de couple decades with the sexual revolution. And people are starting to question, well, what is marriage? What is love? What's meaningful relationships? Who should get with one another and what should happen? Or what is even, in the past five years, they, people have been asking, what is a man and what is a woman? And it looks like, from a whole, we've been... The Christians have been losing the culture war. It just we've given it up. We just we we're, we're here, all these new things, and there's so few of us. We say, okay, so what are the terms of surrender? How do we get over this this hurdle? What what do we do with men and women? It's gotten so bad that if you uh, are to a, apply for a new job, that it has a list of three different choices. It used to be just male and female, but now there's male, female, and non-binary, which means I don't really know what I am. Well, my, my problem is if you don't know what you are, you uh, probably should have flunked kindergarten. But uh, it's, it's gotten so bad that in the state of Illinois that... Uh, you're not allowed to adopt a child or foster a child if you are going to tell that child what gender it is uh, and it, and, but under the age of five. I mean, if it has boy parts, it's a boy. If it has girl parts, it's a girl. But our cultures refuse to accept that because they believe in the in unscientific impossibility that nothing created everything and we're just a bunch of goo changing over millions and millions of years. They don't believe in an ultimate reality. They believe in postmodernism where life is just how you determine it is. Reality is what you determine it is. Now they don't always apply that to the laws of mathematics or the laws of traffic, though some people I wonder if they apply that to the laws of traffic. But you can't do that and get away with it for very long. It, it's, it's just quite sad. You, you, you go in, I, it's, it's so bad I, I, at work. I, uh, I, take a, I, I take a sexual harassment course every year. And you're sexually harassing somebody if you tell a person who is actually a male who thinks they're a female that your sex determines who you are. The scientific community, the medical community are all denying man is man and woman is woman. And because of the argument that is, as long as I love somebody that makes it a real lasting relationship, that makes it something that should be you know, sexually active. That you can, that you can marry. If a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman, and it's gotten so bad 
that people are starting to push, not just for that anymore, but adults are starting to be a lot, uh, allowed in a lot of communities to marry children. The LGBTQ community isn't LGBTQ anymore, it's LGBTQM. And the M stands for MAP. MAP is an acronym of Minor Attracted Persons. It's not pedophiles anymore, it's Minor Attracted Persons. We're going against what God has designed. And they keep saying, well, as long as it's a loving relationship, that's what matters. And so we Christians kind of at a loss what to do. What do we do? Well, I say, and the Bible says more importantly, that we go back to the Bible. We go back to what the Bible has to say. We start taking a stand on Scripture and saying, God determined what marriage was supposed to be at the beginning. This historical account, it's not just some story you're reading to your kids. It's a literal historical account of where we came from. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. It's not. I know, I, have, I, I know there's lots of single people like, right, right now um, that are searching and striving and trying to find themselves a mate and trying to find themselves somebody and they have a hard time doing it because they have the inward drive knowing I'm built for a relationship. I'm built for, have, for having a relationship with somebody else. And that's actually kind of a pointer back to God because God has always been in relationship with himself. Because God is one God but he's in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says revealed in the New Testament that the Father exists, and the Son exists, and the Holy Spirit exists. They're, each one is God, but each one is not each other, but they have a perfect relationship with each other. And that's why God can be a God of love, because He's been a God of love from the beginning. And since man is created in God's image, He reflects that character of man that He is created for relationship. So God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will create him a helper fit for him. And then he starts showing him what his helper is not. And then what his helper is. You see, God starts parading animals before him. Before the man. Now out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens. Now the birds were created on day five out of the ground. And the land animals were created on day six with the man. And God had brought all these animals that he created that were on the land and were in the sky. Adam didn't have to name the fish. He didn't have to go swimming and name all the fish. So he was able to do this all in one day. And he probably gave general names and categories for them. But each time he saw that, he saw something that wasn't fit for him to be his helper. But when he named that thing, he exercised headship and ownership over that thing. That's why when you name your kids, they are yours. They're your kids. You, you don't own them like slaves, but you are in charge of them. So when... Uh, when man was naming the animals, he was showing ownership of them and headship over them. But every animal that he saw before him wasn't fit for him. And that's why when we look at people who are marrying cats and people who are marrying dogs, and I know that it's not happening in our country because it's illegal still in our country, but there was, a, there was a guy in 2008 that married his cat in Germany. Another guy in India married his dog because he thought it was his reincarnated wife. 
animals, no matter how cute and cuddly they are, you can't have a meaningful relationship with them. They're not of us. They're under us. And humans are infinitely better than them. That's why it's, a, it's outright sin listed in the Bible in Leviticus 18. That it's not good for a man or uh, to, to lie with an animal. And it's not good for a woman to let herself be lying with an animal. And then God does something really amazing. He, he actually creates marriage. First he creates the woman. And it's amazing how he makes the woman, how, how, how things happen here. It says in verse 20, Man gave names to all livestock and birds of heaven, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there is not found a helper fit for him. Verse 21. So God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Man was the first anesthesia patient, by the way. He was put under a deep sleep. That's what anesthesia does, puts you under a deep sleep. That's actually where the guy who invented anesthesia actually uh, looked at that passage and he said, you know, I'm going to need to find something like that, see if I can find that in nature. And that's what he did. He actually found, invented chloroform because he was inspired by this passage. That's a nice rabbit trail. And, and, he, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up in its place with fret, flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now there's a lot of people out there who say that men have one less rib than women. Well, that's actually not true. If you ask any medical doctor, we all have the same amount of ribs. But the, one of the amazing things in science is that your lower rib, your lowest rib, is the only rib that can grow back. It's the only rib that, you can, that can grow black, back and God closing its place over up with flesh shows that you know, God's the awesome healer. He's the only one able to actually replace something with flesh. Doctors just cut off and sew up. But God, he, he's able to, to perform awesome, wonderful miracles. Also, the, the, the rib, the marrow inside the bone, is where all a whole bunch of really good DNA is. It's able to, it, it's the DNA of the blood, and that's why there's a lot of people with who have blood diseases. They take, out, they take out some of their bone marrow and replace it with healthy bone marrow from another person, and they're able to have all kinds of, uh, uh, of improvements. And that's where we get a lot of our clones from animals, is from the bones of, from, taken from the marrow. A little bit of fun scientific knowledge for you there. But, and he made a woman. Now, it's interesting, in the Hebrew, the word woman is the word isha. The word man is the word ish. Adam is also another word for man. It's actually the Hebrew, it's just a generic word for man, but it was applied, it's also a personal name for Adam. And what he was taken out was called the Adama, which means land. So it's kind of interesting how God uses these words to show us how intricate they are. And that's why when she was brought to man, he said, This is the last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You know, that's, that's the first wedding vows that you ever see. You know, the reason why in weddings that the groom stands up here and the woman is walked down the aisle is we point back to this creation account that woman is the gift for man to, pro to provide all, all his relationship needs. They're created for each other. And so she's a perfect love gift from God to the man. And that's why... God created Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. Or he didn't create Adam, Adam and Eve and Adam and, and, and Leah. He, he just he created one man and one woman and brought them together. So that the two would become one flesh. 
And it's quite an amazing thing. You see also in the, in the love vows, Adam names her. What did he do with the, with the animals? He named them. What did he do with the woman? He named her. Not that man is any, anything superior to a woman, but man has headship over the wife. The wife is supposed to submit to the husband. Because that's how God created in marriage. That woman was the helper of man, not the ruler of man. It's a it's we have in, in kingdoms we have a king and his and his kingdom. We have leaders and followers. That's just how con, how God designed the marriage relationship. Not that man is any better or anything, because you know she was made from the rib. There's a wonderful sermon illustration I heard a lot many years ago. Woman wasn't taken from man's head so that she's above him. Woman wasn't taken from his feet because she's below him. Woman was taken from his side. To be under his arm, under his protection, and next to his heart. They're equals. And, and this is kind of seen in the Trinity. We see there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. Yet the Father isn't subservient to the Son, but the Son to the Father. He did follow perfectly the Father's will. And the Holy Spirit follows both the Father and the Son. And that's why when we see man and woman coming together, they create one flesh. And the family is a picture of the Godhead of the Trinity. You see the Father and the Mother and the children supposed to rep supposed to represent God as a relational being. Kind of amazing thing. It says, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. When a man and a woman get together, they leave their family and they form a new family. The, the, son's still not sub, the son isn't subservient to the father anymore. The husband and wife are joined together. And the wife isn't subservient to her parents. They're supposed to be joined together and make one family. And it said, And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. That's the only person you're really supposed to be naked with is your wife or your husband. Before sin... They were not ashamed. A Christian marriage, the curse is, is reversed. We are saved. Doesn't mean we go walking around naked everywhere. But in the marriage bed, it's supposed to be pure and holy and undefiled. We're not supposed to go out chasing after other people. We're not supposed to go and do other things. We're supposed to be purity in the marriage bed. Purity in the home. And the God created the perfect situation where man is a federal head, woman is the follower, and they work together. It's not a boss-employee relationship. They're partners, and they work together to rule over all creation. And that's how marriage was designed. And any relationship sexual relationship that goes outside the marriage covenant that's not outlined in the Bible is a sin. It's a perversion of what God made it. That's why God calls it an abomination. Not because God particularly hates those people. It's just you don't take a Ferrari and go mudding in it. You'll destroy the car. You can take a Jeep and do that. But you, ain't, but you don't do you don't use a you don't use a, a nice sporty car like a Corvette and go and try to drive through a cornfield with it. You'll, you'll just drag it in the mud and ruin the cornfield. So God created marriage to be with one man and one woman. God created the woman to help Adam and rule over all creation and be joined to her husband so that they would enjoy each other in all purity. 
Marriage completes us relationally, and it points back to God being a relational being. But here's how you can use marriage for the gospel. See, it also points back to Jesus. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Ephesians 5, 22. It says... Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to every, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might be, present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The same way as husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We just read about that. And this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as, wife as himself, and let, let the wife see that she respects her husband. Husbands, as you sacrificially love your wives, and wives, as you willingly submit to your husbands, not, not in sin, but in you know, as to the Lord, you won't do anything that's sinful. But lay down your pride, and men are supposed to lay down their pride and love. Love and respect relationship. You're actually showing the gospel to other people. You know, I, I've been hearing a lot this week by different pastors that Christians are like billboards. You're either an argument for the gospel or you're an argument against the gospel. If you're not living a radically transformed life, you're turning people away from Christ. I mean, we all sin, we all fall short, but it should be marked by repentance whenever we fall short. We should be apologizing for our mistakes, we should be saying we're sorry, and we should be trying to live holy, decent lives as to the Lord. And whenever your marriage is in a fritz, as far as it's on you, I mean, there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of sinful relationships out there, um, and even in a holy biblical marriage, we have people marrying unbelievers. We have people dealing with sin in their lives. So we're not perfect. But as we live lives that are loving and respectful to our spouses and to our friends and our family, we'll draw people to Christ because they'll see the love of Christ in us. Now some people who aren't married or who have been widowed and lost loved ones it's not a shame on you as we just live in a fallen, sinful world. Life is horrible until we get to go to the other side of life and we get to be with our Creator. And He's going to restore all things and make all things better. And you can live lives holy and pleasing to God now and be a witness to the Gospel just with being loving and kind to other people. But as far as... As far as... As far as the church is concerned, if we keep having over a 60% divorce rate, which is what we have now according to Barna polls, if we keep having men continually looking at pornography and not keeping their eyes on their wives as their standard of beauty, because your wife is your love gift to you, the, church, the outside world is going to look at us and be like, well, I guess this Christian thing doesn't work. And that's why we need to go back to the Bible, preach it, and live it. So the only thing we can do is stand on the authority of God's Word. All right, let's go before the Lord in prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, the gospel and for your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you so much that you created marriage as a witness to yourself and to give us meaningful uh, relation, human relationship because you created us for relationship. Lord, help our marriages and our, our lives reflect uh, the gospel as you know, we love and respect and we honor and serve one another ultimately to serve and honor and glorify you. We ask uh, this, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our, uh, uh, a, a la our last song, and I forgot what number that is. 258. 258. All right. Who at my door is standing? Thank you.